Mr. John Lovins, welcome first of yeah. all. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Um, so in order to get to know you a little bit better, uh, would you mind sharing some information about yourself or about your work? Okay, I'll be brief, but um, I have a long history. I, I've retired now, I mean, I, I'm 70. So um, I started, I made a few notes, so I keep... Yes. <clears throat> So basically, basically, what I want to say is there's two, two sides to this. I can talk about myself as a photographer, but also I, a lot of my life I worked as a head of photography with Greenpeace. So I'm a photographer and someone in a head of a department, which is photography. So it's two, two different roles. They're in. They're interlinked, but uh, it's two different things. So, sort of personal. My personal life in photography was. I left school when I was sixteen, and I wanted to do photography, and I joined a commercial studio. We're photographing cars and fashion and very commercial, um, and I did that for, for for many years, working in different studios and also working in uh, technical like dark rooms and color processing, e everything about photography. Remember, this is 60, so it's film, not digital. Uh, I mean, and and after after a period of time, I I decided um, I did did some education later education, and I, I, I went on a photo course at a university, a, a photography course. Yeah. And, and um, this course really uh, changed, changed my life a lot because I only understood photography as commercial, like making money. You know, you, you take pictures to make money. You understand, like advertising, celebrity, all that. And um, this course was like history of photography, fine art. It dealt with uh, another world of photography, like gallery exhibition. And, um, and it changed my whole view on, on, on photography. So um, after a number of years after that, I joined Greenpeace in, in 85, 87, joined Greenpeace. Um, and it's I, I I had no um, real interest or understanding about activism, like you know what I mean, like protest and all that. I didn't think of photography in those terms. Although my my university course did go into journalism and stuff like that, but but it, it wasn't my kind of photography. I'd never really been a journalist. So um, joined a Greenpeace, but I started in in the in the photo technical. I was working in um, developing film and, and producing film uh, prints from photographers. So, but but I was really excited about Greenpeace when I joined. I didn't know much about it, but it, it, I really thought this is really interesting work. I it's like using photography to to change something, and I'd never really thought in those terms um, and uh, because I came from a commercial background I had a head start in photography because most people in Greenpeace didn't understand photography so I was able to to do things in-house they didn't have to send it out house and pay money I could do everything in-house so I quickly I started in a kind of on a, on a freelance basis I quickly was employed and then slowly I built my way up into the picture editing area and then became head of photography in the early 90s. And head of photography meant that I hired photographers and I edited and I represented uh, the photography of Greenpeace. So I give talks to people and all that. It was it was a big move. And um and the one thing that always troubled me at the beginning was that I felt that it felt like photojournalism, you know, you, you, the actions on the ships, 
were taken by photographers. It felt very journalistic, and the and the way that the the pictures were then sent to the news agencies. It was all part of a news journalist world. And I thought, well, I never really came from this world. So I was kind of troubled by it. But after a time, I realized that, my, that Greenpeace or many NGOs um, are actually more commercial orientated than journalists. For instance, when Greenpeace uh, plans an action, it will decide what color clothes to wear and the banner, what kind of wording, what font on the banner. And I just thought, well, this is commercial. I mean, it's like um, manipulating, it's planning an image. It's not, journalism is like uh, capturing something as it happens in front of you. This is not like that. So I played a part and I suddenly realized I do fit in here because my commercial background actually is perfect. And it really worked well. And not only that, my, my college work for the fine art, I was able to sort of integrate fine art photography into into the imagery, i.e. getting really superb images. <laughs> I, mean, I could go into a, lo a long story, but, but, but that would be digressing. But anyway, um, so, you know, basically, you know, that took me up to, to my retirement. I worked in Greenpeace for 26 years and I took the, 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 I took the photography through analog into digital, the big change and how you know when i first started we would we would produce images from from actions and and whatever and send scans uh, send prints photographic prints to the agencies and then it slowly you know you scan the negative and then you'd send a floppy disk to the agency and and uh, in the end you'd literally just send it by email um but that started to change as i finished started to finish because how can i say it doesn't um sending pictures to agencies is all is good it de but they, it depends on whether they're interested in greenpeace and the story it all between and often they, they don't care so Greenpeace started to move to social media. And, and um, put all their imagery on that. But it, of course, social media is very limited. It only a, a appeals to people that agree with you. So you don't really reach out to. So it's a bit of a problem, a bit of a problem, how, how Greenpeace and photography always work. <laughs> but that's, you know, I, that's another story so um yeah I, I, that, that's sort of about my history of my work really i mean obviously there's a lot more involved but, but basically that's it i could say that in greenpeace you were able to mix two types of photography commercial photography with um more artistic let's say a uh, photography um and i think that uh, most people know that Greenpeace is an environmental organization. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in Greenpeace, you started. Yeah, in Greenpeace. To, in Greenpeace, you started to care uh, more about the environment and nature. Yeah. So environment wasn't always the topic you were interested in. Right. In the very start. I think that now uh, your photography is mostly about nature and the protection of the environment. Yes, that's true. So what do you want to achieve through your photos? What is the message you want to get across? What message do I want to, to give? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I got it. Um, I mean, the message I want to give, well, I, I believe photography can change can change people's opinions i mean it's 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 very tricky um where do i begin 
a photographer if you if you hire a good photographer with a with a good story it it's more than likely to 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 make its way into the news agenda because the pictures are strong and the story is strong and that's um that's one thing that Greenpeace had. It it had a, it had a way of getting him make getting new stories going it, because it, it it had contacts in in okay it had contacts like in Greenland and in the South Pacific, Amazon. These places Reuters and AP never go to because it's expensive. They can't afford to go to these places, whereas Greenpeace can afford. So Greenpeace was coming out with stories about the Arctic, South and Pacific and, and Yellow River, like uh, Tibet Plateau, simply because Greenpeace had the money and the, the, the resources to get to these things. So if you take a good photographer and get a good story, it's very likely that story will make its way and often it'll get into world press. It'll get win competitions. So does that help? Does that answer? <laughs> I mean, that's, um, that's the message. I mean, that's, that's the kind of message uh, I would say. I think that's very important indeed. Yeah. Um, so to make your photos more impactful to the people, to your audience, let's say. Um, what strategies do you use? I mean, is there a specific style you follow? Well, okay. It's it's a story. It's all about stories. The strategy is, is a story. Um, okay. I tell you, I, I, okay. We talk about climate change, right? Yeah. <laughs> climate change is a very, very difficult uh, subject to, to visualize, to, to show. I mean, you know, you look around, if you look, go out the door, you don't see climate change. It, it, but you do, you do in certain area, like, like impact, like uh, wild, are you in Greece, the wild, wild, um, wildfire, you know, the, um, uh, um, and flooding in Pakistan. You have extreme weather, which, which you can, um, you can associate with climate change. Although there's many people who say, well, you know, there's always been bad weather, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that's another one. So we, we in Greenpeace had to, to, to look for more impact, uh, as you say, um, impactful and, and motivate. And one of, one of the... One of the ones was Yellow River, which you mentioned, and also Mount Everest. And the one, one thing we, we made a story was that, that doing these expeditions, we'd the focal point, the story would be um, what we call compar glacier comparison pictures. So we get a picture, an old picture from a science or a museum or something, Get the permission to use it, say from well, even the twenties, even third, you know, up to nineteen eighties. You'd get a picture of this glacier, and the, you know, the story would be this expedition to this glacier. The Everest is a good example because it was a major expedition. It's right at it's called the Wrong Book, and it's right at the base. It's right in the heart of Everest, so it's quite a journey to get there. And I, yeah, I was lucky to, to go on this. But it, it's also about meeting people on the way, local people and that, who tell stories about how the water's affected and blah, 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 lot, you know, how, how they're impacted. All sorts of stories like monk, monks from monasteries and farmers and all sorts of people. And then, of course, there's the journey, the, the journey, and then getting the comparison picture. And so basically a comparison picture is, is finding the exact viewpoint from the 1980 picture, say, to today. And you can see where the glaciers receded or disappeared or degraded. 
and um, and news and the news agencies love that. <laughs> they love that image, it's especially the two put together. You can't argue with it. There is climate change. You can't scientifically. You can't argue with it. The, the, the glaciers never disappeared for kilometers. It's clear. <laughs> See, so so basically, you have a story with lovely pictures of people, and but it's an adventure. It's getting to this place to to get this picture in the end. So, I we found that that was one of the ways you can show climate change as an it, it impacts, and it does affect people. I mean, it um, and newspapers liked it because they could put scientific data to it and. So yeah, I, it's one of the examples of, um, but also, of course, there are actions and demonstrations like, well, like Greenpeace boarding, they're boarding Shell, a Shell oil rig at the moment. Um, so there's lots of potential. Yeah, I mean, the, things have changed. I mean, I'm not involved anymore, but even now, you see, you know, you've got, what Greenpeace will do is find a hook, and the hook is that Shell have um, made a lot of money. You know about this. They've, they've made millions, billions, I think, profit because of the Ukraine war. So that's the hook. So they go and expose Shell by getting onto their rig, and, and you know, it, it gets the news, it gets the focus on Shell. They've got to answer. They've got to say why Greenpeace, there, blah, blah, blah. So that's another impactful way. Um, yeah, that the images are used to, to, um, to tell the story, the environmental story, the climate story. It's not just climate, it's other problems too. But so, <laughs> Does that help? Yes, of course, yes. So the secret is to is finding a good story to express through your photos um so how did you start going on expeditions how did i start going on it well um it i got involved i mean i'm i got involved with the campaigns um and often I travel a lot and I'd, I'd visit the national offices because I'm based in, the international is based in um, Amsterdam, but I would, I spend a lot of time in China, for instance, because it's an interesting office. It's, it's an office that can't, it can't run like a normal Greenpeace. It has to, it can't say, it can't do protests and all that. It has to do a different type of uh, protest. <laughs> but it, you can't physically, go into the streets it's not allowed so um so greenpeace was a t an example of an office that would do very adventurous uh stories like yellow river like um well yunnan and rice so it's not just climate many they would they would like to go into the field as we say and um so, of course, as a photographer, that's very exciting. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I found it exciting to go along with a team and, and go to places. The thing about if you go with a team from from an NGO, from a, from a, from a local country, from the country, you'll be taken to places you could never go as a tourist or you could never go on your own. You, It's like a doorway. You know, they, they deal with all the admin and paperwork and you just say okay we can go here and you just think wow look at i i can go here i mean normally this place is out of bounds to westerners but it, you know what i mean so so um that's what got me very uh excited and involved about doing stories in, uh... and it's an experience and it's an I mean, it's not very easy to travel all around the world and visit all these places. No. Uh, and I think that it shows also how much you love uh, your job and being a photographer. It's a nice question because, as I say, I mean, 
right from a very early age, I loved photography. As, as, a, as a, a young boy, I, I loved the camera and all that. So literally photography has been the whole of my life. I, I still, even in retirement, do photography. Um, so, the, and, and I've never got bored with photography. It makes me angry sometimes, frustrated and but it always keeps my interest. And I feel that I have a skill uh, and an eye to, yeah, to, to be able to uh, communicate something, if you like, you know. I'm not the best. I mean, there's many other photographers that are better than me, and I, I used to hire them. Um, so I, I enjoy being a photographer, but I also enjoy working in photography and working with other photographers so it's, it's a general it's not just i'm only interested in being a photographer it's a collaboration with other people mm -hmm. do you think that uh, environmental photography has an mm -hmm. impact on society i mean does it motivate people to make a change in order to uh, stop the climate change for example it, it, what you're saying is, has it? Are people affected? Can it change? Can photography change people's yeah. opinions? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's a good question because sort of yes and no. I mean, <laughs> it. I, I mean, I've, I've thought about this a lot, and 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 sometimes you have success, and sometimes you have failure. You know, you can do a whole lot of work and, and nothing comes of it. Nobody seems interested in it. But I, I feel, and especially climate change, because, again, the problem with climate change, it's so, you can do an amazing story in the Arctic. I mean, incredible story of ice disappearing and, and animals affected and, and really amazing work. But people... It's it's so far away from their normal life, you know. It's not people have to have to live day by day, and something happened in the Arctic. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But when you get on a local level, it's a little bit different. Like the bushfires, for instance, because the bushfires actually went into residential areas. And affected holiday, it affected business, tourism, blah blah blah. So it gets a lot more attention. Um, and then people, you know, then then the whole analysis of drought and and you know why did they start? What what's going on? And and then you can get these amazing, I mean, powerful images of people's, you know, standing by their house burning their areas. In fact, there is an amazing picture of a Greek, I think in Greece, of a woman. It's a very strong image. I don't know if you've seen it. Do you know she's sort of like that and that's just a house? It, I think it's Greece. Yes, it was, <laughs> anyway. it was two years ago, approximately. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Picture, yes. it's a famous picture. I think it's won a World Press Prize. Um, and I can tell you just a quick little story. I worked with a great Dutch photographer called Robert North, who went to a Russian village that um, was nearby a, a, a kind of a nuclear processing plant. And it, it's quite an old story. It's a long time ago, but this processing plant leaked radioactivity into their local stream uh, water. And a lot of the people or badly affected by, I mean, you know, got deformity and, and crippled. And, and um, this is in Russia, actually. So uh, this is when we could go to Russia. <clears throat> and we took, he, he produced these beautiful black and white images, black and white portraits of people. And we, we took um, this exhibition to a village, uh, uh, well, a, a small town, near uh, this reprocessing plant. And, and, and the government wanted to move this reprocessing plant near this town. And this exhibition went up in the town. And because of this exhibition, people were so um, 
so affected and so moved by it that they made a big protest about this processing plant coming to the town that it that it never came to the town and it was purely because of robert's photos <laughs> so because it's a, so it's a local story very local but the power of the photography affected people it, there's also i mean i have many stories like that uh, with bhopal in india with the um it, it you can work very you know photography has a lot of power on a local level yeah. but on a bigger picture it's it's more difficult. Like climate change is a challenge, but I, I think, um, but I think if you measure it, when I started, when we first started climate in the nineties, I mean people laughed about it and nobody. But when I think now, photography or imagery has gone into the, the, the national consciousness. People don't really question it anymore. They, they, I think climate change is part of the consciousness of the people. So in a way, over a long period of time, all these images have slowly convinced people. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I worked on the article ex exploration for Greenpeace. It's not a personal project of mine, but it was a very, it was a, it was a very strong thing. 30 people got arrested and it's um, it's not particularly about photography, although photography played a major part in it. And what are your next steps? Okay. <laughs> Many projects coming? Uh... Uh, well, the next, I don't, I'm retired. So I, I kind of, um, I take a more, I, I like a, con, a consultant, consultancy sort of position and I'm also a kind of mentor to to young a couple, you know a few younger photographers they they come to me for advice a lot um but I have a um I have a huge over the years a huge collection of images uh, negatives um black and white going right back um uh, you know my uh, a lot of pictures from my Greenpeace days that never got edited, you know, I mean, so much. So slowly I'm working through all that. I'm putting it all together, uh, putting better stuff on the website. And um, yeah, uh, but I don't have any kind of um, big projects going. <laughs> if you know, well, that is, that is my project, if you like, get... Uh, just um, get digitizing all, all, all my work really, yeah. Because it, it's it neglected. I, I worked for so many years. I neglected all the all the stuff, and so that that's my kind of project. But I, I you know, like like doing interviews like this. I I, I kind of get involved, and um, I really love to pass information on to someone like yourself. You know, well, I I, I hope has it been useful. To you, has it been okay? Of course, it's perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, no, it's, it's great pleasure.